smile quickly drives it away not a doubt nor a fear not a sigh nor a tear can abide while we trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey not a burden we bear not a sorrow we share but our toll he doth richly repay not a grief nor a loss not a frown nor a cross but is blessed if we trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way what he says he will do where he sins we will go never fear only trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Amen. 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 If you enjoyed that good song, say amen. 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 Now, if you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn to the book of Judges. This morning, the book of Judges, chapter 17. Book of Judges, chapter 17. Way back in the Old Testament, back to the book of Joshua, was that the Deuteronomy? And the book of Judges, 17. We'll begin reading with verse number 1 this morning. I want you to follow along with us, and someone next to you don't have a Bible, share yours with them, and we can read this Scripture together. Pray for us this morning as we try to bring you the uh, Word of God. In verse 1, And there was a man of Mount Ephraim, whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, that has been stolen from his mother, about which thou cursest, and spake of also in mine ears, Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother... His mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother. And his mother took two hundred shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had an house of gods, and made an ephod, and teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons, who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals. So the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite, 
And the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. I want you to keep your Bibles open there just a minute. We'll be looking at this chapter in the book of Judges. And I want to speak to you on this thought this morning. A hypocrite mother, a deceived son, and a fake preacher. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day. We thank You for health and strength and the blessings of life. We thank You for another privilege and opportunity that we have to be able to bow in Your presence and call Thee our Father. Thanking You, dear Lord, for Your goodness. Thank You most of all that we're saved on our way to heaven. Now we thank You, Lord, for this place that You've given us to worship You, for these that You've sent here. Lord, we believe that there's not a one of them here by accident, but God, they're ordained and sent of Thee. I pray in Jesus' name that You'd open our minds and our hearts and our ears, that You could speak to us through Thy Word. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be just exactly what You want us to be. Do what needs to be done in this service in these hearts. In Jesus' name we pray and for His sake. Amen. I want to talk to you on that subject this morning. A hypocrite mother, a deceived son, and a fake preacher. I believe we find all three of those characters in this story in the Word of God. Now, the book of Judges is an amazing book. If you've never read it or studied it, you ought to take some time, spend some time studying in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is another proof of the great law of human collapse. It's a book that teaches us that men don't get better, but men get worse. That the world's not improving, but the world's falling apart. And if there ever was a book in the Bible that disproved the theory of evolution, it would be the book of Judges. Men try to tell us today that men are, revol- are evolving and are, are growing and are getting smarter and are gradually getting better and better and better and are, are progressing. But the Word of God teaches the very opposite. The Bible teaches that if, man, if God leaves man alone long enough, man will get worse and worse and worse and worse. The truth is this morning, folks, that the sun is burning out. The truth is this morning that the world's resources are getting smaller. The truth is this morning that the world's not moving and making progress in an upward direction, but downward in a downward direction towards disintegration with sin. Somebody said one time that the answer to this world's problem is not integration, and the answer to this world's problem is not segregation, but the answer is disintegration. And I guess that'd be about the only thing to straighten out this world is for the Lord just to blow it smithereens and then create a new heaven and a new earth as He said that He would. So in this morning in the book of Judges, you'll find, if you'll read the entire book of Judges, seven apostasies. Seven times God's people departed from God in the book of Judges. Seven times God let them serve heathen nations that ruled over them with cruelty. Seven times they repented and got right. And seven times God delivered them. You see it happening all the time. God helps them. They do good for a while. They fall. God helps them. They do good for a while. They fall. That's the story of human history. The law that men are going down. The key verse in the book of Judges is in verse 6 of chapter 17, and it characterizes the time that people were living in in those days where the Bible says there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's a key verse in studying the book of Judges. There were no laws. There were no regulations. Nobody had the authority. No book had the authority. Everybody just done whatever turned them on. Everybody just done what felt good. Everybody done that which is right in his own eyes. Do you realize this morning, folks, that everybody's a Christian to their, in their own standard? Everybody lives right according to their own uh, beliefs and, and uh, ways. And that's what happened in the book of Judges. And that's about where we're at in the United States this morning. In a place where everybody just does what they believe is right. There's people today that have this attitude. Well, if you think something's all right, it don't matter what anybody else says or thinks. The Bible says, as long as you feel like it's right, then it's right. And if you don't feel like it's wrong, then it's not wrong. And they have this philosophy these days. I don't even see why we'd have a Bible. If that's the way things were, there'd be no use for the church. There'd be no use for preaching. There'd be no use to read the Bible if your own conscience be your guide. You know, your conscience is a safe guide to what's right and wrong as long 
long as it follows what the Bible's already said. But where your conscience starts excusing you for something that the Bible commanded you not to do, then of course the Bible, you've seen them little bumper stickers, let your Bible and conscience is marked out, let your Bible be your guide. In those days every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That brings us to this story. We see three characters in this story. We see the mother in this story, which was a hypocrite. We see the son, Micah, in this story, which was deceived. And then we see the priest, the Levite, come along, which was a fake. Let's first of all notice this morning a mother that was a hypocrite. Now, this ain't Mother's Day. Wouldn't this be a good Mother's Day message? A mother that's a hypocrite. That'd be a good one sometime. This ain't Mother's Day, but anyway, this mother in this story was this way. The Bible said that she had 1,100 shekels of silver and somebody had stolen them from her. And the Word of God said that she had went around the house and Micah finally got feeling guilty about it. And he said, I'm going to give this silver back to Mama because she'd been cussing and walking all around the house cussing. And she, he said, she's going back and forth, and I'm going to give it back to her. And he turned around, he took this thing to his mother, and he said, Mother, you know that silver you've been cussing about all over the house? And he said, I stole it. I took it from you. He said, you spake about it in my ears. In other words, she had fussed at him about it. Where's that silver? Did you get that silver? It's laying right in there on my dresser, and now it's gone, and I want to know where it's at. And she had been cussing all around the house. Now, here was a woman that cursed. And I say cussed because y'all can understand me better here. But she cussed. And she said, let all kind of vile things come out of her mouth. She walked back and forth through the house. Where's that blankety-blank, blankety-blank money? That blankety-blank money I left it in there on my blankety-blank dresser. And the blankety-blank stuff's gone now. I don't know where it's at, Micah. Now, there's one of the lowest I'd almost rather see a woman drink than cuss. I have. That's what seemed like one of the lowest things that a, a woman can do is allow cursing and filth to come forth out of her mouth. Amen. Nothing so degrades a woman, I don't guess, as much as that. But anyway, she cursed and just raised Cain, run through the house fussing and ranting and raving about because somebody stole her silver. Now you say, well, Brother Danny, that don't make her a hypocrite, does it? No, it don't. There's plenty of ladies around here in Bering that cuss every breath. That don't make them a hypocrite. You want me to tell you what made her a hypocrite? Here's what she done. When Micah turned them things in there and took that silver back to his mother, she looked down at him and smiled and said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my son. Boy, wasn't that a switch. Cussing in one breath and blessing in the name of the Lord the next breath. And you know that makes a person, you know what that makes a person? A hypocrite. When they're cussing for the devil one minute and blessing the Lord in the very next breath. See, when things wasn't going her way, she just blanked a blank this, blanked a blank that, blanked a blank the other. And then as soon as she got her money back, boy, she became, she got right with God all of a sudden. And she said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my son. Oh, I had dedicated this silver unto the Lord. This silver belongs to the Lord. And I'm going to buy you something with it. Oh, isn't it a sad day when mothers are hypocrite? Let me tell you something this morning, folks. If you're a lady here this morning, God's blessed you with children and God's blessed you with a fruit of the womb, and God's given you the pitter-patter of little feet around your house, you ought to be so thankful that God has trusted you to be a mother, and it ought to, it ought to get a hold of you in such a way that you'd want to live a life in front of those children to set a good example for them, and never, never have it said that when your child grows up, they'll have to go out and say, my mother is a hypocrite. I would never want to have to say that about my mother, and you would never want to have to say it about your mother, and if you go Want your kids to think good of you? You'll have to live right in front of them. I remember we was at a shopping center one day and we was giving out tracts. And these ladies come walking out of there and man, they look fit to kill. They was out there and all, just all fixed up. The way they dress these days is weird, you know. I've seen them, I've seen them wearing ties. Look like a suit and wearing a tie. And it looks so funny. And if she come out of this shopping center and one of the boys jumped to her right soon as she come out the door. And she drunk mad and done something, and then about that time one of the other boys got her. And she come walking on up under the little breezeway of that side, uh, sidewalk of that shopping center. And I said, well, I might as well try it too. And there's two of them that already tried her. And I kind of got up my nerve, and brother, her, their lips looked like they had mud on them. It's real dark brown. 
And, you know, uh, she, she come looking at me like that, just looking at those piercing eyes. And I come up to her and I said, here, ma'am, I'd like to give you a gospel track. And that did it. That was all she could take. She, she swelled up and looked at me and tore the track up and went, when are these people going to quit trying to force their religion on me? I don't see how... And you know what I thought as that lady was walking down through the aisle? I thought, I sure hope she don't have no children. God pity those poor little kids. Have to grow up and have to call that their mother. Oh, isn't it sad when mothers are hypocrites? You listen, you know, you, you might be sitting here this morning and you say, Brother Danny, when are you going to learn? Preaching like that's just not rele- relevant to these days. Yeah, I know it. Just like Noah's building the ark wasn't relevant to his day. Just like Jeremiah preaching against the priest wasn't relevant in his day. God's message to the hour never has fit in with society. Never has, never will. And so this mother, we find that she was a hypocrite. The Bible said in Ezekiel 16, 44, As is the mother, so is her daughter. Another thing that made this woman a hypocrite was she took this money and she said, I had dedicated this money to the Lord, Micah, and I'm going to buy you something with it. And he said, Oh, are you? What will it be? And she went down to the carver and the fashionable man and caused that man to make I am a molten image and a false image and a false God. She took that money and said, this money is dedicated to God, and then turned right around and had a man make a molten image out of that money. You see that twisted thinking there? If it's dedicated to God, God said in the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images to bow down to worship them. And God done told them not to do things like that. And yet she said, blessed are the Lord my son, this money belongs to God and then turn right around and buy false God and bring them home for her boy. You say, brother, that was a bad thing to do. We got a lot of women in churches today that take that same money that's supposed to be dedicated to God and go out and buy false gods for their kids and bring them into the house. Need no, I don't have to go into a big detail discussion on that. I want to say this morning, friends, that I believe you, you ladies that are Sunday school teachers, you know what would be some of the best advice I could give you? Is pray and study and be able to say something that will get those kids hard into it. If you can ever one time say something that will get a kid's heart, you've got them. I remember in school, I'd go in history class and I'd sit in there and I'd honestly, seemed like 45 minutes, lasted five hours. I'd sit in there and I'd, uh, our history teacher told us, he said, you can sleep in this class as long as you... Keep your eyes open. And he said, I don't care how much you sleep, but if I catch you with your eyes closed, you'll be in trouble. Now, some people, they, some people can do that, but I can't, I cannot sleep with my eyes open. And I'd sit there and I'd be about to die holding my eyes open. I thought I couldn't stand it another minute or two. And he'd sit there and it was just like a... Every day. Just like a record that was hung up. Just that same tone of voice. Now the when are we going to get out of here? And I've heard, I've heard Sunday school teachers that sounded just like that. I've visited a lot of churches and preaching revivals and all traveling stuff, and I've sat in some Sunday school classes that honestly, I'd sit there and I'd turn this way, I'd turn the other way, and I'd do this, and I'd count the boards across the ceiling, I'd count the piece of seal tag, and the Sunday school, and now we see here that Moses and uh, went across the Red Sea, and I'm just, oh brother, just puts you right off to sleep. And I, I, I found out that if somehow. Some way you can say something to get that kid's heart and let them know that you really believe what you're saying and really have seriousness about it. That, that'll be the greatest thing you can do as a mother. Old G. Campbell Morgan, great man of God, when he stood and preached those great sermons, he said, my sermons were Bible stories I learned from my mother. Nobody will ever know till we get to judgment just how important the life of a mother is in their children's life until they get to the judgment. I know we're not, we've, we've talked about the father before and you've heard me preach all things about the father being the head of the home and have to have family devotion and everything. But this morning we're talking about the mother that was a hypocrite. Oh, it's a sad day when it's like this. That brought on the second part of this message this morning. Had there not been point one, there probably would not have been point two. 
But since there was a deceived or a hypocrite mother that made point to, there was a deceived son. Now, Micah wasn't all bad considering how he was raised. At least Micah had a desire to live, I believe, according to what God would have him do. He's just ignorant and deceived. Now, the Word of God tells us that Micah, he took these, these things, and the Word of God said that Micah had a house of gods. He went in, you could go into Micah's bedroom, and over here was a little image, and over there was a little image, and over there was a little image, and all over his wall was posters of his favorite images. And he had, he had, uh, had all these things on there, and he had the pictures all over his bedroom wall and everything, and the Bible said Micah had a house of gods. And Micah was deceived. See, if he had been taught better, no doubt he would have probably never fell for those things. But he was deceived. My dear friends, the Word of God tells us that Micah was in bad shape. He was deceived. You think about how many children in the world are brought up in that same shape today. Deceived, never being taught the truth. Listen, you know, a sad thought struck me the other night. I was listening to the radio, Brother Ralph Sexton Jr., matter of fact, on the, on the radio the other night. And he's talking about how he'd like to see revival in our day. And I got to thinking about something. Do you know that unless God sends revival to McDowell County or Marion or wherever you live and whatever church you go to, that it has been so long since there's really been a real revival breakout that if we're not awful careful that some of these children in our church are going to grow up and when they get grown, they're never going to be able to remember what it's like to see God really moving in the church. Now me, thank God, I've had the privilege and God given the opportunity to see a real, honest to goodness, Holy Ghost revival. I've been in one. I saw them, the one I got saved in. But do you realize that there's thousands of children growing up in the United States that never know what it is to see God really get on the service and souls get saved and people repent and get right. Little kids are growing up these days not even knowing what that is. And they're going to be deceived. They're going to be hurting just as quick as they get old enough to think. They're going to say, man, church is boring. The world's got all this stuff to offer. I'm checking out of this business just as quick as I get old enough to. You and me as parents, we ought to pray. We ought to work. We ought to witness. We ought to do something so that our children will be able to see God's power move in our church and in the churches of our land. We're cheating them if they don't get to see that. I guarantee you they may not be but six, seven years old, but if they ever really see God moving in services, they'll remember it when they grow up. I, some of you remember when you was a little brother and you scared and crawled up under the pews when the saints were shouting eyes. And you remember how you saw people weep and cry and go to the altar and pray, and it made an impression on your life. And this son was deceived. And he was so deceived that he hired him a priest. A Levite came through town, and he at least knew a little bit about Scripture. He knew that the Levites were the priesthood. And he said, boy, there's a Levite. If I could get him to come and be my priest, my own personal uh, common priest, God would bless me. See, he had a little bit of understanding of the Scriptures. And he said, hey, how would you like a job? And he got, gave this guy a job. And he said, I'll give you so much pay a year. I'll give you a new suit of clothes every year. And I'll give you um, so, such and such. I'll give you all the food you can eat. In other words, room, board, clothes. That's a pretty good offer for a pastoral job in those days. I mean, all you can eat, new clothes, and um, a place to live. What more could a preacher ask for? And this guy said, well, if you put it that way, I'll just take you up on that. And, he's, and he got him in there and he said, now I know that God's going to bless me because i got a Levite in my house and God blessed the Levites and God promised to put His blessing on the tribe of Levi. They are the real priesthood. And now you just come right in my house with me, buddy. You're going to be my best friend. Stay right beside me and be my own personal priest. You belong to me now. And thank God the Lord's going to look down and He's going to bless my house. But we see how that this man was deceived. Brother, just because he knew a Levite personally, just because a Levite put him to live with him, did not mean that God would bless his house. Let me say to you this morning, just you may know a preacher personally. You may be very best friends. You may live right next door to a preacher, but that don't mean God's going to bless you. You're deceived if you think that if you got somebody, if you hang around with somebody good, that God's going to bless you just like He does them. You've got to have it for yourself. 
God won't bless you if you sing in the choir if you still cuss on the job. God won't bless you if you pay your tithes if you buy beer with the rest of it. God won't bless you if you shout and praise the Lord, but you live so that people doubt what you do in church. God won't bless you if you quote Scripture if you think you're better than other people. God won't bless you if you hug everybody's neck if there's envy and slander and, and wrong thinking in your heart. My dear friends, just because you do one thing don't mean God is going to overlook something else wrong that you do. Just because he had a Levite in his house didn't mean God was going to bless him. He was deceived. This boy was deceived. You can't get by with stuff like that. And I believe we've got a lot of people today that see. There's a lot of people in Marion that think just because they go to church on Sunday that God's pleased with them and God's going to bless them. Hey, they come out with a new movie. And I, they sent me a, a Christian cinema. You know, it puts these Christian films out. They send me a little brochure every now and then. And they put this... Uh, they put this new movie in there. I thought about getting it for us sometime. The name of this movie is Super Christian. And the star of the show is mild-mannered Clark Kent. C-A-N-T. And he's, his mild-mannered Clark Kent is right with all the rest of the group all week long. And then as soon as it gets Sunday, presto, he becomes Super Christian. I thought, I ought to get that sometime. I'd like to see that, wouldn't you? Boy, we got a lot of them in Marion. Man through the week. They're right out there. You can't. They're just mild man and reporter, mind their own business, work for the company all week. But just as soon as it gets Sunday, they change completely. And they've been on this old pious attitude and go to church, our Father. Ha, ha, ha. That don't mean nothing. They're deceived. I mean, God's the same on Monday as He is on Sunday. If you can't worship God on Monday, you ain't going to do much worshiping Him on Sunday. He's the same. He'll be the same Friday, Halloween night as He is here on Sunday morning. You know, when it gets Halloween night, boy, people get scared. They're witches. I mean, black cats will be out. Did you see the moon last night? Boy, that looked just like Halloween, didn't it? Friday the 13th turned backwards, 31st. And brother, this Friday night will be there. And there'll be a lot of people get a little demon in them. I used to get one on Halloween night. Boy, I remember when I was about 17. I don't know if it's still that bad now. About 16, 15, 17. The stores, Ingalls and all these stores here would not sell eggs on Halloween night. Y'all remember that? I don't know if they, they, they still do that or not. but You couldn't buy none. We went to every store in town. Boy, we need some eggs. We need some eggs. I said, no eggs, boys. Means ain't getting no eggs. We tried to look like we had a family and kids starving at home. We tried to do it. And they, no eggs. They wouldn't sell us none. Well, let me tell you something, folks. God will be just as real Friday night as He is on Sunday morning. And He should be worshipped on Friday the 13th, just like on Sunday the 7th. Just like on Sunday the 1st. And I believe this morning this man was deceived. And we find that it gave him some bad results over in the next chapter, which we'll not take time to get into. But we want to notice thirdly this morning a priest that was a fake or a fake preacher. I don't guess there's anything more disgusting in the sight of God than a fake preacher. There's nothing more any, any more useless. There's nothing more any uh, nauseating in the eyes of God and man than a fake preacher. Old Brother Woody made a statement down here the other night, boy, that was something else. I believe the Lord must have led him to say that. He said there's more preachers in MacDowell County doing less preaching than any place I've ever seen in my life. MacDowell County is the place where you can shake a bush and ten preachers will fall out of it. Now, I ain't preached in a year and a half. The other one's still studying up for his first message. I believe this morning, my friend, that this preacher, he was a fake. He wasn't a bit more priest than a man to moon. You know that? But here he come down the road, and he just mind his own business out soul journeying. And here's this guy walks up to him and said, how would you like to make a little money? And he said, that sounds good. He said, I'll give you so much money and a brand new suit and all you, if you'll come in and be my priest. And suddenly he said, the Lord's called me to preach. i just become a preacher. I believe a lot of them have been called like that. You can disagree if you want to. Somebody asked Billy Kelly one time how he knew he was called to preach. 
And of course, you know Billy Kelly. I mean, he was, he was just kidding. He's a great man of God. He said, I woke up one morning and I didn't want to go to work and I was craving chicken. I said, God's called me to preach. Sure is the word. <laughs> good offer. He said, you'll pay me so much money. You'll give me a salary. You'll give me a suit of clothes. I'll become your priest. And so he took him on into his house. He consented to minister with hire before Jehovah in a house of images, contrary to the second commandment whom the Lord God made. That Levite, I guarantee you he knew that second commandment. That Levite knew they wasn't supposed to have no false gods in their house, but he went right in there and he said, I'll be your priest. I'll relay your messages from you to Jehovah. I'll take care of you. Knowing what was going on was completely wrong. He was a fake. He was a fake preacher. You know what a lady said one time? She said, my pastor never preaches the gospel. And if, he did, if I didn't hear it over the radio, I'd starve to hear the Word of God. And I asked this question tonight, this morning. What in the world would a man be preaching if he didn't preach the gospel? What else are they to preach? I mean, this lady went to church every Sunday and said, My pastor never preaches the gospel. Brother Gene here and another boy, Brother Page, is coming to be with us this Wednesday night. I was out shopping center giving out tracts not long ago. Brother Page said there's some young teenage girl goes to high school and is preaching to him. I guess, Brother Gene, you know about this. And Page said, I wouldn't have believed this. If, you hadn't, if I hadn't heard it with my own ears, I wouldn't believe it. He said, We was talking to some young girls, teenage girls, and one of the preachers got to preaching on some stuff. He mentioned something about premarital sex or something like that. And the girl come over and said, We want to ask you a question. Did you say that that was a sin? And he said, Yeah. They said, and he said, They couldn't believe it. They had never heard anybody say that it was sin to have premarital sex. Now, that ain't, not, that ain't in Los Angeles or Africa. That's in Marion. And he said those girls were church members and no doubt go to church regular. I had never heard their pastor preach against that. What in the world is he preaching? There ain't no use preaching about what's going on in Africa. We need to be preaching about what's happening here. And my dear friend, this guy was a fake. The first thing you know, I'll tell you how you know he's a fake. The first thing you know in the next chapter, the migrating day nights come along and journey, and they offered him a raise, and he left Micah and took off with them. That's the way you know he is a fake. But I want to say this morning, if a man's really a preacher, he's not for sale. I mean, he'll, he, he's not going to say, well, if you'll give me more, I'll leave this church and go for you for more money and all of this stuff. This man was a fake. He wasn't a real preacher. You know, we need to get back to the days where we have some real preaching. Somebody said one time to the preacher, if you're convicted by your own sermon, you're preaching. And I guess that's right. Boys, I preached sometime, and I got to preaching, and I got to preaching, and all of a sudden I went, whoa, here. And I was the first one to the altar at the invitation. When you get convicted by your own sermon, then you're preaching the Word. And I want you to know, my dear friend, you don't find much of that anymore. You don't find much emotion. You don't find much conviction at all, matter of fact. Money is nothing after all. They said a man, that was when the Titanic was going down, he picked up three oranges to eat and try to stay alive. The man had $300,000. These days, folks, we're living in a day when the constant thing you hear, preachers are constantly being bombarded with education, education, education. Learn, learn, learn. And certainly there's nothing wrong with education and learning. You ought to get all you can and can all you get. You ought to have every bit of learning God will give you. But I want to say this morning, to be a preacher, it takes more than just book learning. That's why our seminaries and institutions today are just turning them out on a little assembly line, boy, just like, just like carbon copies each other. Little preacher, boy, you heard one preach, you heard them all. I mean, just a carbon copy. That, the Bible said the, the wisdom of this world is earthly, sensual, devilish. You're going to have to have the wisdom that ascends from above to be a preacher. 
I mean, this man, he had, he didn't have that wisdom. Brother, back in the old days, there were some old men of God like old Bud Robinson, like some of those old preachers. They, some of them couldn't even hardly read their name when they got saved. But man, you talk about wisdom, them guys had wisdom. They were smart. I never will forget hearing some of them old stories about how them old men of God had wisdom that the people just could not resist. I've heard of more than one man that got saved and couldn't even read a word of English and took his Bible and went to the mountain and stayed for a week or so. And when he came back, he was beginning to read and became a great preacher. And God used him to do a great work because he got the wisdom from on high. That wisdom is more important than the wisdom this world can give you. The wisdom that God gives is, is pure and without partiality, without hypocrisy, and easy to be entreated. And the Word of God teaches us that's the kind of wisdom that we need. I heard about an old preacher one time. He's one of them smart. You know, back in the old days, the preacher had to, he had to do more than just come up here and preach. I mean, the preacher was about the only symbol of law and justice in the towns back in them old western days. Sometimes the sheriff and the deputies were crooks. Sometimes the church was the only place of law and order. And, brother, they exercised it too. One time in the community they had a, they had a chicken thief. And somebody was stealing all the chickens. And, brother, they, the preacher got up there and, and he said, now, this Sunday morning, there's a chicken thief in this service. Somebody's been stealing all the chicken. And he reached down and pulled out a great big rock and set it on the pool. And he said, now, God showed me who the chicken thief is. The Lord's revealed it to me. And in just a minute, I'm going to hit him in the head with that rock. And, brother, he, he went on to preaching. He got on to his message. And, brother, he got to preaching. And all of a sudden, he got in a big way. And about the middle of that message, he grabbed that big rock and right back to Thor. And one guy ducked. That's the wisdom you only get from God, friend. See, uh, God can only teach you how to do stuff. You can't learn that at school. Some of those old preachers knew what they were doing, brother. One old preacher one time, it was back when women used to wear hats, great big old hats. And I mean, they'd cover two or three rows with one of them's hat. Two rows behind them and a row in front of them. All of them would wear them. And one old preacher got up. And he said, now, ladies, if you don't mind, while I'm preaching this morning, I'd appreciate it if you would remove your hat. For somebody might be behind you that can't see. And we'd appreciate it if everybody could uh, see this morning, pay attention. So I'd appreciate it if you would remove your hats. And all the ladies removed their hats except one. One lady sat back yonder in the back or close to the back, and she just sat there and would not remove her hat. And everybody just kind of looked around a little bit, and it kind of... He said, uh, I thank you, ladies. Uh, I thank you, ladies, for removing your hats. And she never would take hers off. And he said, you know a funny thing happened not too long ago. He said, I was in a church preaching one time, and I got up and I asked all the ladies to take off their hats. And all of them would except one and come find out she's bald-headed. And that lady picked it up and set it down there and didn't say another word. Now, you, can you see one of these little, you know, little preachers of our day being that smart? No, friend, it takes the wisdom that God gives in order to be a real preacher. This man was a fake preacher. He didn't know anything about stuff like that. Somebody asked the old black preacher one time, how that he got so much results? How that he done anything when he's preaching? He said, the first thing I do is I read myself full. The next thing I do, I think myself clear. The next thing I do, I pray myself hot. And then I let go. I believe that's the best advice to preachers that you can possibly give. Read yourself full, think yourself clear, pray yourself hot, and then let go. I want you to know this morning the disciples didn't come to Jesus and say, Lord, teach us how to preach. They come and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. If a man learns how to pray, you won't have to teach him how to preach. If a man learns how to pray, he'll preach one way or the other. Brother, this man was a fake preacher. I want to tell you a story I read with Dr. Jack Howe one time that illustrates this point so good about a fake preacher and a real preacher. He said there is a living God that still leads His preachers today. He said when he was just a young man early in his ministry, he was called to preach a revival at the high, nice high society fashionable church. And he went to that church and he preached on Sunday night and nothing happened. And the pastor had told him, he said, we don't allow any loud preaching. We don't allow any emotion. We like it quiet and cut, you know. 
And he said, oh, okay. He preached Sunday night, nothing happened. Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, nothing happened. He said he went back to his room that night so discouraged and so low that he's going, he decided to get down and he said, God, I'll pray all night for your power to be on that service tomorrow night. And so he got down and he prayed and sometimes up in the early hours of the next morning, the Lord reassured him that victory was on the way. He said, everything's going to be all right. So he went back to church that night feeling confident that the Lord was going to move. And his subject for that service that night was going to be the prodigal son. And when Brother Hiles preaches on the prodigal son, he always names the characters in the story. You know the story of the son that left his father and went off to a far country and wasted and everything, then come back and repented and he had a brother and everything. He gives names to the character. He said he always names the prodigal son Bill and he always names his brother John. And he named them, you know, telling, he said, now Bill come in and Bill went down there and wasted all of his substance with riotous living and then he came to himself and he come back and John came in. He told it like a story and acted it out. And he said he got up to preach that night and he said he began to introduce his message. He started talking about the story he's about to tell and it came time for him to introduce the first character which would be Bill, the prodigal son. And he said when he got to his name, he said he could not think of Bill to save his life. He said, now this boy, his name, uh, uh, this boy. And he said he went around and around in circles. He backed up. He started all over again. He tried it again. And he said he could not think of Bill. The name Bill just would not come to him. And, and finally, he, he thought, well, I'll name him John. And then by the time I get to where the other brother comes in, I'll think of his name and give the other one the Bill's name. And so when he got to the first of that part again, he said, Now the name of this son was John. And he started preaching about John and how that John became a prodigal son and went off and wasted his life and went out and sin and run away from home. And then he, he decided to come back one day and repent. And the father accepted him. And the other brother came in. And when he got to that other brother for the life of him, he could not think of that name. He said the people were beginning to notice and they, they were kind of snickering a little bit knowing that he was messing up. He said he felt miserable and he thought, oh boy, I'll be glad to get through with this, get this message over with so I can get out of here out of my shame and out of my embarrassment. And he could not think of, of uh, Bill to save his life. He'd done name the prodigal son, John, he could not think of Bill. So when the, when the brother came up, he stumbled and stammered around there a few times. And then finally, just out of... of uh, De desperation and just out of frustration he just said little bud he said the brother's name was little bud as his nickname and then for the rest of the message he called the prodigal son john and the other brother little bud and he said he went ahead and preached and preached that night and he said again the invitation and he said boy i'll be glad when it's over so i can get out of here i've made such a mess out of things tonight and all of a sudden he said there's a boy back in the back of the church got up and started toward the aisle. And he said it was, of course, a blessing to him, but he, he just it surprised him, really, that anybody would, would even come to the altar after a mess that he had made. And he said he'd come to the aisle, and he's turned around here, and then he started like he was going out to the back. He said, well, I don't blame him. After a message like that, I wouldn't get saved either. And he started out going like he was going out of the church, and he got almost to the back, and there was a lady sitting on the end of the pew, and he grabbed that lady and hugged her neck. And he said that lady broke out into tears. And about that time, the chairman of the deacon sitting on the very front fell down and broke into tears. Here come that boy, and which was evidently his mother, the woman coming down the aisle, praising the Lord. And that pastor who told him they didn't allow any emotion wound up at the altar with him and praying and crying and getting all excited about this boy getting saved. And brother, they just had a time. The chairman of the deacon was in it. The pastor was in it. The boy and his mother was in it. And he said, I didn't know what was going on, but I sure did like what was happening. He said, we went ahead that night and dismissed the service. As I was going out the door, the church secretary stopped me. And she said, preacher, there's just one thing I want to know. He said, what? And she said, who told you? He said, who told me what? He said, she said, who told you that that boy was going to be in this service? Who told you to preach on the prodigal son? 
she said, well, the Lord did. I said, what are you talking about? She said, that boy that was in this service tonight had run away from home a year ago. He said he'd been a thousand miles from here. Nobody knew where he was. Nobody knew where he was living. And all of a sudden, unexpectedly, he popped up in this service tonight. How'd you know to preach on the prodigal son? I said, well, I just did. She said, but I've got to ask you something else. He said, what? And he said, how did you know that his name was John? Brother Jack Howell said, well, I didn't know his name was John. Boy, about that time he felt something. Go up in and he knowed it was the Holy Ghost. That kept him from remembering the name Bill. And all through that message, he called the name of the prodigal son John. He said, who told you his name was John? He said, I didn't know his name was John. She said, that's the chairman of the deacon's son. He's been run away. His name is John. He come back and repented tonight. She said, but I've got to ask you one more question. Who in the world told you that he had a brother whose nickname was Little Bud? Well, he said, when she said that, that that's all he could stand. He said he got to shouting. He went back to his room that night and he spent most of the entire night laying on his face, praising God and thanking God that there is still a living God who can speak to his preachers and tell them something when they need to know it. Brother, that's the kind of preachers we need in this day. This man was a fake preacher. I tell you this morning, folks, if you're here, let me tell you, there is still a God on the throne. You say, well, I can't understand a lot of things. Join the crowd. I can't either. But one thing I know, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that I shall stand before Him at the latter day. And I know here that everybody in this church will someday face that God who give this man this, uh, this message. Well, you'll face that God that Micah's mother will have to face. You'll face that God that Micah faced. You'll face that God that the Levite faced. You don't want to be a hypocrite mother. You don't want to be a deceived son. You sure don't want to be a fake preacher when that day comes. I hope each and every one in this church will be ready to meet Jesus when that day comes. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going to get a song ready this morning. God's spoken to your heart. You realize and know there's something between you and Him. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not saved. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. This will be the morning that God may do a work in your heart. While the piano begins to play softly this morning. If you're here in this service today, you'd say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart. I know there's a living God. I know one day I'll stand before Him face to face. Preacher, would you pray for me? I wonder if you'd just signify that this morning by slipping up your hand, taking it right back down. Was there one right quick? Just slip up your hand, take it right back down. We're going to pray for you this morning. We're not going to come to you or embarrass you. We're just going to pray for you. Would you slip it up? Take it right back down anywhere right quick. Let God speak to your heart. Would there be one? God bless you, sir. Somebody else? Somebody else? God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. Somebody else? Christians, you pray. There's somebody here else that say, Preacher, my life is not what it ought to be. I know that God's real, and one day I'll face Him face to face. Pray for me. Would you slip up your hand? Yes, God bless you. Someone else? God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. All right. We're going to pray for you just like we told you we would. Then we're going to sing a verse of an invitational hymn. If God's speaking to your heart today, you realize things ain't right between you and Him. I'm going to invite you to just step out of your seat in just a minute. Make your way down to this altar and get things right with the Lord. He's real, friend. You're going to stand and face Him one day face to face. Why don't you let God do a work in your heart? Why put it off till tomorrow? Why not just get it settled this morning? It'll never get no easier than what it is here today. Our Father, we pray in Jesus' name now that you'd speak to hearts. Lord, I pray for these that raise their hands. Lord, whatever their need is, I pray, Lord, that maybe they'd find their way to this altar this morning. Get it right with thee. Then, Lord, I pray for these that didn't raise their hands, that maybe wanted to and didn't for some reason. I pray you'd deal with their hearts. 
Help them, dear God, to come to this altar. Get things right with you before they leave. In Jesus' name.